webinar. So um, <clears throat> thank you all for being here. Um, we um, this is the last webinar of a webinar series for Barry uh, this season, and we're very fortunate to have uh, Kate Fessler uh, join us today to give her presentation. So as you can see, again, this is the last one of the year, and uh, this will be on building a tabletop denatural strawberry system. Um, before I go into introducing Kate um, and other people here, I wanted to uh, mention that if you um, have questions during the webinar or at the end, please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A uh, or the chat. Either way is fine. We'll be monitoring both of those. Uh, we will um, have two polls, one that I will start before Kate starts her presentation and another one at the end. Um, and then the recording, as you could hear, probably this is recorded. The recording will be posted um, in two different places on the uh, University of Minnesota um, website that I will copy here and also on the Wisconsin Fruit website. So you will be able to see both of these um, show up in your chat right now. So here's the with the Minnesota, that's the same recording. So do not worry about copying both of them, but the recording will be posted on either one of those. So feel free to uh, um, go back and watch the recording after. You will also have access there to other uh, webinar recordings um, from this webinar series and others. So feel free to investigate all of that. There is also here a video that um, I was asked to share with all of you. Did I stop sharing my screen? No. Okay, where's the chat again? Here is a video of um, on tabletop that uh, Kate Fessler and Annie Claude who's also uh, one of the um, webinar participant, but also one of the uh, co-author on this presentation uh, put together. So feel free to watch that uh, on your own time. It's about uh, tabletop strawberries. So feel free to check all of those information. Um, I will introduce the speakers and then, um, actually, no, I'm gonna launch the poll now. That'll be easier. So. Let me share this poll with you all. It's just two questions and there will only be two questions at the end as well. So if you can take a second to um, answer this question. The first one is, do you grow strawberries? So you have different um, choices that you can answer here. And then the second question is about what is the hardest thing about growing strawberries? And again, you have a couple choices here as well. So please take a minute to, uh, um, to do this. In the meantime, I will stop sharing my screen. And then Kate, if you wanna share your screen now. So I should have thought about that before, but that will work. Okay, we have pretty good participation in the polls. We're at about 76%. So um, go ahead and answer the poll if you can, and then Okay. All right, I guess I'll end the poll now. And you should be able to see the results. And in the meantime, yeah, Kate, if you want to share your screen, that will be great. And then I will um, introduce uh, both of you. So um, I wanted to introduce Kate first. She is our speaker. She is she grew up on her family's small orchard and alpaca farm outside of Detroit, Michigan. <laughs> Um, Kate is a graduate uh, from 2018 of the uh, Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts, where she obtained her degree in biological sciences with a concentration in sustainable foods. And then following a Fulbright fellowship to Finland, she joined the University of Minnesota, where she's a master's student in the Applied Plant Sciences program, working with Dr. Emily Hoover and Neil Anderson. And her current project, that's why we asked her to come and give the stock for us, is about assessing the efficacy of tabletop strawberry production for Minnesota's climate. And before Kate starts, I wanted to also introduce Annie Claude, 
So maybe I also forgot to introduce myself. I'm sorry, I'll do that after. But um, Annie is also um, one of the um, people that works um, on as an extension educator in the, in the University of Minnesota and is a coordinator of this webinar series uh, with some of my colleagues here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, Leslie Holland and Amaya Tucha. And so um, Annie works on fruit crops and has been assisting Kate with the educational outreach efforts around the tabletop strawberries this season through video production, like the video I shared with you, and this webinar. Um, so um, please feel free to, uh, to look at this, um, this video that I mentioned, um, and Annie was a, a participant on that. And so just to correct my mistake here, I'm sorry, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Christelle Guido. I'm the fruit crop entomologist and extension specialist here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. With that, uh, Kate, if you wanna take it away, thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, like she said, I am Kate Fessler and I am working on my master's thesis research all about testing the efficacy of a day neutral um, tabletop strawberry growing system for Minnesota's climate. And so today I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about you know, all of the components of the system, what it was like to build it, and um, you know, all of the sort of tips and tricks we learned along the way. Um, so thank you all for attending today. So just a little bit of background on the project. This is a Minnesota Department of Agriculture grant collaboration, and it was inspired by Steve Poppy, who some of you might have run into in the past. He was a grower and researcher out in Morris, Minnesota. It was inspired by him going out and visiting some growers in Ontario, Canada. You can see their tabletop system on the right in this photograph. Um, he had never seen anything like this before, and he was really intrigued by it. Um, it has some advantages to it, including the fact that elevation allows for greater airflow, which causes allows for fewer issues with pests and diseases. It also allows for a higher proportion of marketable fruit. And of course, there's less strenuous labor associated with harvesting and weeding from a standing position. Um, there are some challenges associated with it, particularly acidity and salinity, and um, there are some higher upfront costs. So I'll get into all of those a little bit more later. But when Steve got back to Minnesota, he was really interested in whether this was a system that could be adapted to growing outside in our climate. And so that is why we wrote the grant and got started on this project. So just a little bit about the structure of kind of how I'm going to advance through the seminar. I'm going to start by talking a bit about strawberry production and um, demand in Minnesota. I'm going to talk about tabletop strawberry systems more generally and then get into the kind of critical components for a system like this and how you select some of them and then talk about construction tips before I get into the management and economic side of things. Um, and then, of course, we will have a Q&A at the end. So just a tiny bit of sort of morphology of strawberry plants. I'm sure a lot of you have grown strawberries before, are familiar with them, um, but they consist of the crown, which is a compressed modified stem from which all of the roots and shoots arise. Um, they produce sexually and asexually. So sexually via their fruit, obviously, and then asexually through a division or through these runners, which give rise to the daughter plants. I'm going to talk a little bit about fruit trusses later, and fruit trusses are these shoots that come up and actually bear the flowers and the fruit. So there are three main types of strawberry, um, strawberries in terms of flowering, and they are the June bearing, the day neutral, and the ever bearing cultivars. So ever bearing cultivars, we aren't really going to talk about too much because they're not really in widespread commercial production, so they're just not as relevant. But June bearing cultivars are distinguished by the fact that they are the most commonly grown in Minnesota and in the upper Midwest in general. And they are June bearing because they initiate their flower buds once a year. And then they overwinter them and they usually generally flower and fruit in the spring or early summer. So they are perennials because they're pretty cold tolerant, but they have a pretty short harvest window. So you can really only harvest in June and in, in Minnesota, at least the season's pretty much done by the 4th of July. And that really short harvest window means that we only get about 8,500 pounds per acre per year with June bearing cultivars. Day neutral cultivars, however, um, have only recently been grown in Minnesota. They're less cold tolerant, um, but they produce throughout the season. So we manage them as annuals to kind of get around that cold tolerance and all of these new production methods that we have gotten into and that I'll talk a little bit more about um, have really been able to, they've been able to be grown in Minnesota because of those. 
Um, however, pests are still a little bit challenging with these types of strawberries, just because they do have that longer um, season extension. But we do get an average of 14 weeks season extension growing day neutral cultivars, and that results in 22,000 pounds per acre per year for in-ground day neutral cultivars, as opposed to in-ground June bearing cultivars. And obviously that's quite a big increase. So one of the reasons why we're really interested in expanding you know, local strawberry production is because two thirds of consumers are really interested in buying local. And that is evidenced by the fact that we have a 364% increase in farmers markets between 1994 and 2013, and a pretty staggering 181,750% increase in community sport and agriculture or CSAs since the mid 1980s. Um, in the 80s, I believe there were maybe four to six CSAs, and obviously now there are just thousands. However, 98% of strawberries in the country are grown in California and Florida. So we really can't meet that local demand in 48 out of 50 states, and that makes strawberries a very high value crop in Minnesota. We really consume a lot of berries in the state. Um, and so people, if they see local strawberries, are going to buy them usually. So current production in Minnesota, um, like I mentioned before, is with June bearing cultivars with the perennial matted row system. And this is a nice system in a lot of ways. You know, it's perennial and it's not too labor intensive for a lot of people, but it, it has really low yields. And, and the way that it works is that you set your plants out and you let them grow their runners out into this sort of mat, which is where the matted row part comes from. You usually put straw down between them and, um, to be honest, weeds are a really big problem in this kind of system, but most of the time, the way that strawberries are sold here is through direct market ventures or agritourism. So pick your own farmers markets, um, direct to market to restaurants or farm stands, and supply just really doesn't equal demand. So of course, there are challenges to increasing production here. Um, some things that I've already mentioned, like weeds and pathogens. Um, strawberries have a really low lying kind of non-competitive growth habit, and so they can be really easily and quickly overtaken by weeds. Um, there are pests, both native and introduced, including the tarnished plant bug or ligus bug, spotted wing drosophila, and Japanese beetles. We also have to, you know, factor in climate and climate change. So we're having less predictable weather. I think we all have experienced that over the last year. And we are also in USDA zones three and four, which means that we have those low temperatures of negative 29 to negative 40 degrees C in the winter. We also have a lot of different soil types in the state, but most of the really favorable soil types, the kind of really rich well draining soils are currently being used for crops like wheat and corn and soybeans. And then labor, which is always a pretty hot button topic in agriculture labor is really, really challenging in strawberries. It's backbreaking. You have to be kind of down on your knees or bent over in a crouching position. Um, and that can be really taxing on your body over the long term. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about tabletop strawberry systems as a potentially kind of new innovative way of getting around a lot of those challenges. So the first thing that I always have to have to say is that Tabletops does not necessarily mean that there are tables involved. There kind of can be, um, but in general, tabletop growing refers to growing at table height. And so this was a system that's hydroponic in nature and was developed in the Netherlands in the 1970s. And since then it has spread across Northern Europe. It's now common in Asia and Canada, and it allows um, for year round local production in a lot of places, particularly in the Netherlands and Belgium, usually in greenhouses, but more and more frequently, it is being used in, in outdoor um, production as well. So when I talk about you know, the system that we're building, I'm talking about a gutter system. There are a lot of different ways that you can kind of configure your tabletops, but gutters are one of the most common ways. So on the left here, you can see some production in a greenhouse in the Netherlands with you know, the gutters and then also growing in grow bags on the floor of the greenhouse. On the right, you can see a photo of some plants just being planted in the greenhouse at the University of Arizona, where they have also done some extensive um, tabletop strawberry growing work as well. So I'm gonna talk about a lot of the parts of this system and I think it can be really handy to sort of see this cross section so that you know kind of how they all fit together before I get into the details. So as you can see, we have our day neutral strawberry plant 
and that has been planted into the soilless media inside of this black plastic kind of planting trough. Um, that is then set into the galvanized steel gutter. And so the gutter has a drainage channel at the bottom so that any excess leachate can drain out of the media into the drainage channel and be carried away so that you don't get wet feet in your strawberries. They are a little bit more susceptible to root rot than other, than other plants. So you just have to be careful about that. Um, and then the whole thing is sort of fed and watered through this header line, which has spaghetti tubing with emitters attached to it, and that delivers nutrition and water directly to the root zone of the plant. So there are a lot of advantages to this system, and a lot of those advantages really have to do with the lack of soil and the elevation. So lack of soil means that there's no weed pressure. You have no seed bank to fight and there's really minimal weeding. Um, there was not a single day that I went out to the system this year and thought, I'm gonna weed today. Um, any weeding that happened was sort of incidental during harvesting and I plucked maybe one or two little tiny weeds out, never really an issue. Um, there's also less pest pressure. So you don't have any overwintering of pests in the soil um, and you can consequently use less fungicide and insecticide. I sprayed three times this year. Um, for reference, Steve Poppy in Morris, when he's managing his in-ground day neutrals, he sprays one time per week. Um, they are also easy to cover, which kind of goes along with the indoor-outdoor component. They can be portable, so if you have inclement weather, you can lift the troughs up out of the gutter usually and carry them inside, or you can put them under a high tunnel. Um, it's pretty adaptable in that way. And then of course that makes labor less demanding as well. You harvest from a standing position and it's more accessible for people with disabilities or mobility issues. Kind of the last thing that's important to mention is that you can use marginal land to do this. So if you have poor soil, that's totally fine. It's not a problem. If you are in possession of a former industrial site where you're worried about soil contamination, you can grow anyway. You can grow in parking lots, on slopes. And um, for places where you're concerned about flooding, that's obviously not gonna be an issue because it's, it's elevated. Of course, there are challenges. It's not, all, um, it's not all advantages, but a lot of the challenges are kind of the flip side of not having soil. So you have to keep a much closer eye on acidity and salinity because acidity in particular can really influence nutrient availability for the plants. Strawberries prefer a pH of 5.5 to 6.5. And so your local water really matters. You have to get it tested. And then it's good to tailor kind of your fertilizer regimen to whatever is already present in your water um, and to whatever your kind of natural acidity of your water is. And you have to keep in mind that no soil means no soil derived elements. Um, so all of the nutrition is going to be coming from your fertilizer solution. Water and temperature is something that I want to mention and is something that we're still sort of exploring. So because of the elevation, there's less soil temperature buffer buffering um, and there is a greater potential for, you know, more evaporation and for bigger temperature fluctuations. But we actually haven't necessarily found that temperature has been an issue this year um, during the heat wave when a lot of in-ground growers had their plants totally shut down, mine kept going. So while that's tangential evidence at the moment, we're gonna keep exploring that. And if you kind of stay tuned with this project, I'm really hoping that I'll be able to track that down and see whether that is an issue or not for us. Um, you can of course use protective structures to better control you know, the microclimate around your tabletops and, and manipulate your temperature that way. Um, there are also the economic factors. So there are higher startup costs associated and I'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, but we also got comparable or higher yields and we have really high marketable, really high proportion of marketable fruit with this system. So that also plays into the economic part. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the components that you really need in this system. And I'm going to start by talking about site and infrastructure. So if you want to build a system like this, the first thing you have to decide is if you want to build it yourself and you don't design it yourself or whether you want to use a prefabricated system that you just put together. Um, generally speaking, of course, prefabricated systems are very sturdy. They're frequently made of galvanized steel, so they'll last a long time, but they are more expensive because of that. Um, regardless of which you pick, it is important to have these materials. You have to have a gutter or a bench to you know, act as your support structure. 
And then you need to have whatever you're planting into, whether that be troughs, buckets, um, pots, or grow bags. Um, if you are using troughs or buckets that don't come with media already in them, the way grow bags do, you have to buy media. And then of course you also need your plants. So we use bare root transplants. Um, and then one of the most important things here is the fertigation system. So it's important to have a corrosive capable fertilizer injector, because if you have you know, lower acidity, you potentially need to be able to amend with acid. And if you don't have a corrosive capable fertilizer injector, you learn quickly, like we did at Morris, that you will melt the inside of your fertilizer injector. We don't recommend that. Um, so then you also need header lines, which you know, you'll use spaghetti tube emitters with, or you can use drip tape. You need a hose to connect to wherever your local irrigation um, source is and then a bucket for your concentrated fertilizer solution and truss tape, which I will come back to and show you um, what exactly that is in a moment. Um, in terms of your site, you have to have full sun and either build on a gentle slope or include a drop between your supports. So here is a photo of our materials. So on the far left here, you can see our gutter, which is the meteor system gutter, and then the second photo is of our plants in the troughs um, in their soilless media, then a photo of the fertigation board, which we'll have a little walkthrough of later, and a photo of our header lines with the spaghetti tubes with the emitters attached. So in terms of selecting media, you can either go with media that comes in bales that you break open and you put into whatever you're planting into, or you can go with grow bags. There are a lot of options when it comes to soilless media, and the three things that I have sort of narrowed down as being important factors are pH, water holding capacity, and sustainability. And the degree to which you sort of put emphasis on any of those factors, that's really has to do with your, your brand and what, what you find to be the most important and what you really prioritize. So with peat, for instance, there is a nice low pH that provides a little extra buffering because even if your water is a little bit lower in pH or is a little bit higher in pH, so lower in acidity, um, it can help regulate that to kind of keep it in the pH zone that you want for strawberries. It also has a very high water holding capacity, 10 to 20 times its weight, but it is highly unsustainable, unfortunately. Um, you know, it's pretty destructive of the ecosystem to um, mine peat, and it is not really renewable in our lifetime, unfortunately. Coconut core, though, or cocoa peat, is a good alternative that a lot of people use and like. It has a pH of 5.8 to 6.8, and it has a pretty high water holding capacity, seven to nine times its weight. It is more sustainable as it is a renewable waste product. We also have perlite which most people don't grow in only perlite. Usually it's a component of a mix or a blend, but it has a neutral pH, a pretty low water holding capacity, and it's non-renewable, but it's also totally inert and non-toxic. So there's a lot of information here about cultivar selection. Um, these slides and this recording will be available to you later, so you can come back and look specifically at information about the different cultivars that we have trialed. But I want to just kind of point out that that I will talk about um, on the next slide the cultivars that we chose for our particular research project, and point out that we have cult or we've trialed seven day neutral cultivars in Minnesota since 2013, and out of those we don't recommend EV2, which has small soft fruit, San Andreas, which has large fruit but very low yields, and Mara Dubois. But I would like to kind of add a caveat to Mara Dubois that that we have a lot of tangential evidence for this. We haven't actually done the research yet, even though we're hoping to, um, but it seems that Mara Dubois is a really big target for spotted wing drosophila because it has this really soft, fragrant fruit that they really enjoy, that they're very attracted to. So cultivars that we chose, they're both day neutral. Um, we picked Albion, which is an older day neutral cultivar that is really popular, people love it. It has large fruit, it has very good flavor, so high total soluble solids, which is a measure of sugar. And it is resistant to verticillium wilt, phytophthora crown rot, and anthracnose crown rot. Um, it has moderate, moderate yields, I would say. Cabrillo, on the other hand, is a much newer cultivar. It was more recently released by, the, by UC Davis, and it has very high productivity. Um, in comparison with Albion, it's, I think, almost twice as much production uh, during some parts of the season. 
It has nice, large, firm fruit. It has very good flavor. So it also has high sugars. It is moderately resistant to powdery mildew, verticillium wilt, phytopter, crown rot, and common leaf spot. It is, however, moderately susceptible to anthracnose crown rot. So when you're thinking about what cultivars you should choose, um, you really have to think about what your priorities are in the balance of flavor, yield, and disease resistance. So if you're particularly worried about disease resistance, you know, you can look at, at the, the characteristics of each of these different cultivars and kind of pick according to that. Um, but it's also, you know, important to think about, do your customers really value good flavor, in which case Albion and Cabrillo maybe would be good choices for you? Or do you do a lot of value added products like jams or pies, things like that, in which case maybe high yield is the most important for you, in which case maybe Portola or Cabrillo would be, would be good options. Um, no matter which cultivars you pick, you should order bare root transplants, as I mentioned before. Um, that's really what's recommended. We don't recommend starting strawberries from seed in general. So I'm just gonna get into some construction tips. Um, some of these are a little bit specific to the meteor system, but I tried to just pick out the things that are going to be sort of generally relevant, even if you design your own system. So here is a photo of the system in St. Paul on the left and in Morris on the right. And here's the day of construction in Morris. So the number one thing right away is that when you're driving your support poles, you have to keep everything really plumb and even and level. Um, if you don't, it can make the whole support system a little bit wonky, and then the system can buckle and collapse under its own weight. So that's the most important thing right away to take the time to make sure that, that everything is nice and level there. You also have to include from one end of the system to the other, a quarter inch drop at least between each of the poles going down, because you want to be able to provide a nice gentle slope um, so that you can have good drainage. If you are you know, using a prefabricated system, we were really careful to bolt and caulk between all of the sections of the system to ensure that we didn't get any leakage so that we could you know, collect all of our leachate and dispose of it um, sometimes via um, you know, just dumping it on thirsty plants. Um, it's kind of up to you what you wanna do with it, but it was, it was important for us not to have that kind of source of non-point pollution. So we knew what was happening to all of the fertilizer we were using. So when you put your system together, um, first thing you need to do is prep the media when you're getting ready to plant. You do this one week before planting. So we broke open our bales, we spread them out on a tarp, and then we kind of did this fluffing and wetting um, to hydrate the media. And so when you set it into the troughs, that gives it some time to sort of fully hydrate and then to settle so that you know what level you're sort of putting your plants at so that you have the crowns you know, not buried too deep. Um, but also not sticking up out so that your roots are exposed. So here are our troughs with our two different medias that we were testing out this year. Um, and so they sat like this for a week outside before we started planting. So the day of planting, you wanna prep your bare root transplants. Um, most places recommend that you soak them for 20 minutes to an hour to help kind of break dormancy because they've been in refrigeration for a while. And then you trim off any dead or dying plant material and you also can kind of trim the roots to the correct depth for planting. And then when you actually do plant, we found that it was really handy to pot up some extra plants just in case not all of your plants survive the transplanting. And then when you're actually planting into your troughs, planting them at a 45 degree angle. Um, so they're kind of leaning over the edge of the trough is important because those fruit trusses that I was talking about earlier, that way they fall over the truss tape and that kind of catches them and supports them so that they don't hit the edge of the plastic and break under their own weight. We planted nine plants per meter long trough. So they're at a relatively high density, but that didn't actually impact our productivity per plant, at least for this year. Um, and we recommend that when you do plant to water with plain water for one week, no fertilizer, because that also helps them kind of break dormancy and stay healthy when they're putting on their, their nice foliage. I'm going to get to management in a second, but I want to mention winterizing really quick while we're in the kind of components part of, of the talk. Um, this is pretty low maintenance when it comes to winterizing and storage because you treat these as annuals, you compost the plants and media at the end of the year. 
clean out your troughs for indoor storage because if you leave the plastic outside over the winter, it can get brittle and break down so it won't last as long. Um, for the meteor system, at least, because it's galvanized steel, it's very temperature tolerant, it can stay outside year round. And then in the spring, you just pull your plastic troughs back out, you bleach them to decontaminate them, prep them for the next planting. Steel systems should last, I would say, at least 10 years. Um, they're very durable, but obviously if you design your system and build it yourself, your durability might vary a little bit. Uh, I you know, include this picture on the right because I get a lot of questions from people about whether they can reuse their media. This is what the media looks like at the end of the year. It's so root bound that you know, I think it would be kind of a pain to try and get it out from, from between all these roots. And of course, because it's, it's been grown in all year, the structure of the media is affected by that. It starts to break down. And if you reuse it, you do run the risk of mitigating some of the advantages that you get um, in terms of pest and disease pressure, because then things might be overwintering if you use it the next year. I'm gonna talk a little bit about management and economics. So in terms of management, we fertigated two times a day when the weather was not insanely hot. So I put the system on a timer um, and it went off and watered for 10 minutes twice a day. So 10 minutes at 5 a.m., 10 minutes at 5 p.m. But during the really depths of summer when it was really hot out, I did also water usually a third or even a fourth time per day. Um, usually, you know, more at the more in you know, 10 and two or maybe at noon. So you just have to keep an eye on things and see how your plants are doing and keep an eye on the weather, obviously. All of you are good at that. Um, the other thing is monitoring the acidity and salinity in the leachate. So at first, high water pH at the West Central Research and Outreach Center in Morris led to some pretty poor plant growth, which we then started amending with sulfuric acid and had no problems after that. Their plants were beautiful. We also took tissue samples. So we took them one time per season and that can really help us see what's actually making it into the tissue of the plant. So we know that we're hitting our nutritional targets for the strawberries. And because we did the tissue sampling, we found last season that we had a magne magnesium deficit in St. Paul and we could really easily fix that by just amending with um, Epsom salts. We harvest two to three times on average per week when they really hit their peak, which is usually sometime in mid-August, I was harvesting up to four or five times a week. But whenever I was harvesting, I was also removing dead and dying plant material and runners. So hopefully this video clip will work. I find that it is easiest to sort of show you a little bit of a walkthrough. Um, so I'll look at the chat and see whether you guys can, can get the audio. Hopefully it will work out okay. This is our fertigation board. This is where our water comes in, mixes with our stock concentration, which is a really concentrated fertilizer solution, and then goes out through our main header line, through our emitters into the actual troughs to water the berries. Um, so what we have here is we have a hose that's hooked up to this valve. And the water runs up through here, comes through, the pressure is actually measured right here. So here's our pressure gauge. And then at this point, it can either be diverted down through these valves into the mix right injector, which uses the water pressure to draw our stock concentration solution up through the tube. It then mixes and heads out that way, comes up here, and then comes down these lines to come into the actual um, irrigation main header line. There are two here. Um, we're only using one line, but if you wanted to run two header lines, you could also run one down the other side of the system if you want for some reason. Um, we also have this line. So if, for instance, I was looking to flush the system, obviously fertilizer has a lot of salts in it. Um, sometimes there are issues with pH or something like that. If you wanted to water with just plain water, you would turn these valves to this position so you turn them off so that the water doesn't divert down through the mix right injector and you turn this one on and so that makes it so that the water comes up through the hose and just shoots straight through this pipe and into the main header line okay all right 
So following up from that, here's that kind of close up picture of our fertigation board. Um, we put it together ourselves. It's kind of fun, actually. Um, it can be used for more than one row because it has multiple lines, as you can see. Um, that's a little bit adaptable. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about nutrition, but I know that plant nutrition, if you get really deep into the details, can make people's eyes glaze over really quickly. Um, so I just want to reiterate that this system works based on hydroponic principles. So it's important to test your irrigation water, see what's there already, um, see what your acidity level is, and then tailor your fertilizer and your amendments accordingly. Strawberries are light feeders. So you don't need to whack on a whole bunch of fertilizer in this system, but you do have to keep in mind that the fertilizer is your only source of nutrition for the plants. So again, consider sulfuric acid amendments if you are having a hard time hitting kind of that 5.5 to 6.5 acidity, but make sure that you talk to your fertilizer rep about that because solubility issues can be a problem with certain amendments. So if you add acid and it turns out that it reacts with something in your fertilizer solution, it can cause some of your nutrients to drop out of that solution and then they won't be accessible to your plants. Um, I will say that if you're interested in following this project and in learning more about strawberry nutrition, keep an eye out on the human extension site because I'm hoping to write an article that will talk a little bit more about you know, each of the key micronutrients and things and what they do for strawberries and what they do for the quality of your berries in particular. So this is a fun thing that we learned. Um, and by fun, I mean just very unexpected. Um, wind damage is not usually a huge problem for strawberries. They're so low lying um, that I actually sent these pictures of these bruised leaf surfaces and of the bruised petioles to my advisor, who's been working with strawberries for years and years. And she had no idea what it was. Um, I sent it to my other advisor, who has been working with hydroponics for years and years. He had no idea who it was. It was eventually Jim Luby, who has bred strawberries in the past, who told us that it was wind damage. So obviously in this picture on the far right, you can see that there are these kind of dead spots on the leaves that weren't overly problematic, um, but the bruising on the petioles were more concerning because then those, those um, leaves didn't do as well. However, this was really easily remedied, thankfully for us. So we have prevailing westerly winds that come whipping across the soybean plots next to my plot, and there's no good windbreak. So we put up a windscreen. I actually put this up in the middle of the pretty bad heat wave. So I was doing it at 5 a.m. when it was only 80 degrees instead of 99. Um, and it worked really well for us. On the right, there's a picture here that shows just how important it was to have this up because after a thunderstorm a couple of weeks ago, the T post got completely bent. And if the windscreen hadn't been there, I'm totally confident that the wind would have just whipped the troughs right out of the gutter. And then we would have had significant damage to the plants and the fruit. This is obviously not going to be a huge problem for you if you put them in, for instance, a high tunnel, or if you have a windbreak, you know, in the area where you're planning on growing, but it's just something to keep in mind. In terms of common diseases, we had pretty low disease pressure in 2021 just because of the drought. You do have fewer diseases overall in this system. That's what the research has showed us so far, but it is always worse after rain events because some of the, the worst diseases for strawberries are fungal. Um, common leaf spot is something that you see a lot in this picture on the left. It is only cosmetic, so it's not a huge um, cause for concern, thankfully, when you see it. Botrytis is the next thing. It's also known as gray mold. And to manage this, sanitation is really key, so removing dead and dying material. And thracnose is becoming a bit of a more of a problem for northern growers, but it is at the moment most commonly an issue in the south, and um, it causes these sort of brown dead spots. And so avoiding overhead watering is important to kind of keep anthracnose away, and of course removing any sort of infected tissue for both botrytis and anthracnose will help um, make sure that it doesn't spread to more of your berries and more of the plant material. I'm gonna talk briefly about common pests as well. These are the main three things that we saw this season, but I really put spotted wing drosophila like front and center because I get asked about it a lot. Um, the good news is that it is not as problematic in strawberries as it is in a lot of other berry pests, for instance, raspberries and blueberries. And the larva and the eggs are very hard to detect in strawberries. So for instance, I took about five pounds of unmarketable fruit at one point. I pulverized them, tested them for larva, and I only found five larva. 
um, I, when I showed people pictures of the larva in kind of the fruit, a lot of people couldn't identify them until I pointed them out. So it's reasonable to think that a lot of your customers, if there does happen to be a larva, will not find it because they won't be looking for it. Um, that being said, post-harvest handling is important when dealing with spotted winged Drosophila and strawberries. Um, getting your berries into refrigeration right away and keeping them there really helps with the texture um, issues that can come along with SWD. And if you refrigerate your berries at 35 degrees Fahrenheit for three days, it will totally kill larva and eggs. The actually more common um, kind of problematic pest for strawberries is tarnished plant bug or ligus bug, which people who already grow strawberries will be very familiar with. They suck on the flowers and they cause cat facing, which you can see on the far right. So scout for these a couple times a week. You do that by tapping flowers into a dish and counting the nymphs. The nymphs are this leftmost little green guy, and then the adults are the middle photo. Um, the damaged fruit is still edible, so if it's not too misshapen, it is fine for fresh eating. But if it's really damaged, you know, it's just not attractive to people. You can use it for value-added products like jam or pie, etc. Japanese beetles were actually more of a problem this year than we would have anticipated. We think because of the drought, they just had kind of slim pickings um, in other parts of the experimental station. Um, their effects are largely cosmetic. But they can affect yield. They did start going after the fruit this year, but they were actually not that hard to control. We used Pyganic a couple of times and that kept their numbers low enough. With most of these, you know, especially spotted wing Drosophila and Japanese beetles, consistent harvest is really the best strategy to kind of avoid damage from these pests. So I'm going to talk a little bit about economics now, and I, I do want to emphasize that this is not um, a main focus of my thesis research. So, you know, I can talk specifically about our setup costs and I can kind of give you some estimates, but, you know, I want to sort of reiterate that that if you design your own system, your costs will be different. Our costs, we're using the Meteor prefabricated system, and it's obviously relatively expensive. So when you look at this chart, these are our one-time setup costs. If you, for instance, used a Meteor system, this would be your cost to set up a row every you know, 10 years or so. Um, the most important thing here that is that one-time um, setup cost that is more expensive is the mixed right fertilizer injector I talked about before and making sure that it's capable um, at handling corrosives because you don't want to be stuck having to order a second one if you don't get the, the right one the first time, which is what happened to us. Um, so I like to pass that along that scientists aren't, aren't perfect when we're trying to figure out how to, how to work a system like this. Um, these are our annual costs. So these are your non-reusable items that you purchase each year. The most notable thing here is that you don't need to rent or use any kind of specialized machinery when you're growing with this system. So you don't have to try to track down a bed shaper, which is one of the main things that's important, you know, when you're growing in ground neutral strawberries. And overall, this leads to about a $68 savings per row per season um, over in ground day neutral production. So generally speaking, when we talk about, you know, profit for extension, we talk about profit per acre, but most people don't have a full acre of tabletops. Um, that would be a little bit labor intensive to install and to monitor. And so most people grow them in high tunnels. Um, this is my dual use slide. I can kind of sneak a little bit of data in here as well as giving you a little bit of a, a profit estimate. So the first thing I kind of want to draw your attention to here is the yield per plant. So over the course of a season growing strawberries, most people want to see about three quarters to a pound of production per plant. And we achieved that this year, which was really great news. Um, so we achieved that through that kind of mix of cultivars growing both the Albion and the Cabrillo. And that can be followed up really easily by looking at the fact that we had pretty low loss, only 15% loss. So while we harvested a little more than you know, a pound per plant over the course of the season, we you know, could sell almost that entire pound, which is great. Um, I also want to point out the average selling price per pound that we have it estimated here at five dollars per pound. And that is potentially a conservative estimate. A lot of people at farmers markets, et cetera, sell for five or six dollars a pint, not a pound. And we have seen people able to sell for up to eight dollars a pint, which is obviously at the higher end, but depending on the farmers market, 
and kind of the customer base, a lot of people are willing to pay that for out of season strawberries. In terms of net profit on this slide, I am subtracting annual costs. So this is what a row should earn after the establishment year. And that means that depending on, you know, whether you use a prefabricated or home to size design system, a row could pay for itself within one season. Um, this is all information in terms of, you know, the number of rows per high tunnel and profit per high tunnel. This is based on a kind of standard 48 by 72 high tunnel. And, you know, obviously all these factors I've talked about are why these are only estimates, because if you build your own system, um, if you use materials that you already have around, obviously, you know, your, your costs versus your profit will be a little bit different and will depend on, you know, the cultivars you choose, et cetera. But I wanted to give you this kind of estimate and give you this information so that you have a starting place and you can see what we were taking into account when we were factoring in, you know, all the stuff for our own costs. So that is the end of the information that I have for you. Um, I would like to acknowledge my advisors, Dr. Emily Hoover and Dr. Neil Anderson, my committee member, Dr. Carl Rosen. We've had a lot of really wonderful researchers on this project, including Lindsay Miller, Nate Dahlman, Steve Poppy, and Emily Teppe. Annie Claude has been really helpful with the outreach and education extension aspects. She's our extension educator. And then the Ways and Andy Petran um, are our where we're cooperators, and then the Anderson and Smith lab members are my fellow lab members who've been really supportive and have come out and helped harvest, which was absolutely selfless because they only went home with several pounds of strawberries each time. Um, and then also our source of funding, so the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, the Minnesota Agricultural Experiment Station, and all of the people who, you know, donated materials and the companies that we worked with and our vendors. So with that, I can take questions. Um, if you have questions that I can't answer for some reason, please, please reach out to me and or Annie. And if I can find you an answer, I absolutely will. Um, yeah, just let me know. Thank you very much for attending. Well, thank you so much, Kate. That was great. I really appreciate you uh, spending the time to talking to us about uh, Tabletop Strawberry. So we have several questions that came along the way and please keep them coming through the chat or the Q&A. But the first one would be, um, is there a reason you wouldn't put drip tape directly in the gutters with the strawberries? Does this does the emitter have an advantage? And that's from a star. So I think, you know, I haven't used drip tape, but I don't see any reason why you couldn't, to be honest with you. I think it would be easier if you were using troughs as opposed to grow bags, because grow bags, you know, have just the one little hole. It's easier to put an emitter in there. Um, but I think drip tape should be perfectly fine. Okay, thank you. So one question was really how many uh, running feet of row would you need to compare to one acre worth of production? Do you have the math figured out for that by any chance? You know, I think I have done the math for that at one point. Um, essentially, if you put in an entire row or an entire acre of um, tabletops, the net profit when I calculated it was almost $100,000, which is pretty good. However, that's really labor intensive. That's a pretty intense um, type of production to be doing. So that's why I calculated it more based on, on per high tunnel, because that's a more realistic thing for people to start with. And I would recommend more um, starting on a smaller scale to see if that it works for you and that it's a type of production that you're willing to, to sort of, you know, gain the knowledge and, and expend the upfront costs for, and then think about expanding. But if you email me about that, I'm perfectly happy to talk with you about it more or to, um, you know, do some math for you, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, it would be the math on like the, the pound, poundage that you would get, right? If you want to compare to about 20,000 pounds per acre is what they're um, estimating here. How many rows of gutter would you need to have to about having uh, 20,000 pounds of production in the, the tabletop? So something that people can follow up with you if they're, they're still interested in that. Margaret had a question about sustainable materials for soil mix, wood chips from pine trees for acidity, what are your recommendations you would have? So there are some mixes that you can find. Um, we're testing one from Berger at the moment, actually, that do mix in things like decomposed wood chips, stuff like that, to kind of make, make the mixes more sustainable. 
Um, they have had success with that, but I will say that they do mix in partially decomposed or mostly decomposed wood materials because when wood materials are, you know, fresh and decomposing, the sort of um, microbiome, the, the um, bacteria that are in there that help with the breaking down can actually immobilize certain nutrients. So that's not necessarily recommended. Um, yeah, I see somebody just popped up organic recommendations. We are currently using the OM6 um, Berger media, which is organic, and we've had great success with it. The one that I was talking about that is actually a little more sustainable is the BM4 Berger mix, but it is not um, organic. So. Okay, a question from Star. Where did you source your starts from? We got them from Norse Nurseries in Western Mass, which is actually right near where I went to college. So I've toured it, it's a great facility. Um, they're really helpful. And we have gotten our Cabrillo through Lassen Canyon. Um, they're out in California. Cabrillo is a little bit more limited to get a hold of just because it was more recently released. So not a lot of places have the license, but they've been really helpful. Um, and if you go through a broker, if they order a big, a big order, they can usually split the orders up for different growers. So. Right. Indeed. Um, Star had another question. Did you experience wasps in your fruit? No, actually I didn't. I was, act I was a little bit surprised. I didn't experience birds, chipmunks, wasps, none of those things were big problems, but I did have a lot of chipmunks around my plot. So it seemed like they couldn't quite figure out how to get up there. Um, in the last month or so, a mouse did start living in there. And so I found about five berries that it nibbled on. Thankfully it didn't do too much damage, but it's a good question. Yeah, and, and wasps I think is on the mind of a lot of people because we still have you know wasps around it. And this year was in some places particularly bad. But I suspect that the chipmunks, once they figure it out, if you stay in the same spot, you might have more problems than, than none. Okay, <laughs> so um, next question is the size and source of the gutters. The size and source. So they are about six inches, 16 inches wide. They're not super wide. Um, we did an 80 foot long row, both here in St. Paul and in Morris. Um, and we sourced them from Meteor Systems. Um, there are a couple of different places that um, there are a couple different places that you can find them, um, or people do build their own. But we got ours via Meteor. Okay. Oh, in depth, also I see they are six inches deep. Our our troughs are the gutters are maybe four inches, not including the drainage channel. Um, so that way they kind of really securely hold the six inch troughs, but the troughs are have a six inch depth. What do you recommend for the vacant space below the gutter, whether in ground or hanging pots? So yeah, that's an interesting question. So that you can grow things beneath. Um, I would recommend that you just keep in mind pests and light requirements. So if you're really organized about it and you keep things nice and clean and sanitary, um, you can kind of keep your, your pest issues down, but um, that can get out of control if, you, if you're not on top of it as most things in life are. Um, I have seen people grow raspberries underneath, um, especially if they hang them, if they hang their gutters from a high tunnel, they can winch them up, things like that. Um, yeah, that's the main thing that I've seen. But yeah, I just kind of want to reiterate, just keep in mind space and light, I think are two really big things. Was there a second half to that question? Um, well, for now, that's good. I was going to say in your exper experience, you have black fabric. So that's also something people can consider is just something very um, simple as black fabric. Yeah. Um, the distance between, distance between the rows, what would you recommend? So when I kind of did the estimate for the high tunnels, I put about six feet between the rows. That's what I think people usually do if they have multiples of these rows. It just allows you to really get in between them and get a cart between them and not have to worry too much, but you could space them a little bit closer depending on what your space requirements are. I would just recommend having at least a couple of feet on either side to make it a little easier to harvest. Okay. Um, did you experiment with overwintering the trays or the plants? Seems like you could get a second year of production from the plants. We haven't experimented with that just because most people do this as an annual system, 
But um, if you are going to overwinter, I just recommend that you take the troughs and the plants, you know, out of the gutter so that they're not elevated and really exposed to the winter wind. Um, so I'd put them underneath the, the troughs and cover them, maybe mulch them in, um, you know, or put them up against a building, things like that. Um, so we haven't experimented with it, but I think it is something that people do and that you could definitely try and see if it works well for you. I think the worst that happens is that, you know, they don't make it and you just get another batch of plants and plant them as annuals. Any reason for running the gutters widthwise to create more and shorter rows instead of lengthwise to create few longer rows in the tunnel? I mostly did that because um, when, when we're using the meteor system, which comes in sections, you can really, you know, sort of customize that, you know, to the lengths that you want. So in the tunnel, I put them sideways because 80 foot rows kind of didn't quite work with a, I think a 46 by 72 foot tunnel. Um, but the way that I had them configured, you'd still have four feet on either end. But this is what I'm kind of talking about with the adaptability of this system, that based on what infrastructure you have available and what site you have available, you can sort of configure things the way that makes the most sense for you. Sure, that makes sense. Okay. I have a couple more questions, but I just wanted to stop here for a second and send uh, launch our exit poll. So please feel free to answer the poll uh, that I pulled up. Um, and in the meantime, we'll continue with, um, with a, one more question here. Um, is the tunnel either high or low a requirement for success in this system? Are uncovered systems feasible? Uncovered systems are definitely feasible. Our system was completely uncovered. Um, the one thing that we, like I said, had to add just because we had issues of wind damage was the, the sort of windscreen. That was not difficult to put up. I put it up in a couple of days. I probably could have put it up in one day. It was just about 105 that day, so I didn't want to be out all morning. Um, that was really the main thing. It, they were completely fine being totally uncovered. That wasn't a big issue for us. So yeah, you don't, you don't have to have a high tunnel. Good, thank you. Um, date your harvest started? I think our harvest started on the 28th of June. So it started with just, you know, a couple of berries at first. And then, you know, the kind of first flush came in at the very start of July. We would have continued harvesting up until this coming week, except that they shut the water off at the agricultural experiment station. So I was on campus from like 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. the other day because I had to collect all my final data a little bit unexpectedly. Um, so you can just kind of harvest from, from whenever they start, which for us, like I said, was the end of June all the way up until the last frost. Okay. Or the first frost, sorry. Okay, so we're going to finish with um, uh, one, one last question. We can't do them all, I'm sorry, but we're, we're running against the end. Uh, when did you plant your strawberries? That's a good question. So we planted, I think, the last week of April, first week of May. You can plant a little bit earlier with these because strawberries can actually handle temperatures down to like the mid 30s um, without dying. You know, usually at the end of the season, if it gets down to, to the mid 30s, they will start to shut down their production. But at the beginning of the season, you don't have to wait for the ground to, you know, thaw and dry out to be able to plant. So you can plant earlier. So you get that season extension kind of on the front end as well. So depending on your local climate, I think mid to late April, beginning of May is reasonable. Um, and then, yeah, we started harvesting a couple of months later, maybe eight weeks later. We did remove the first round of, of flowers. A lot of places recommend that to sort of encourage enough vegetative growth before they really start pumping out fruit. All right. Well, we're right at the end of the hour. I'm going to end the poll, share the results. And so um, thank you so much, Kate. This was great. Uh, we had a lot of questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them. Feel free to, um, to email Kate directly or um, find one of us either at University of Wisconsin, Madison, or Minnesota, either myself or Annie Claude from Minnesota, and we'll pass on the questions. That's not a problem at all. Um, thank you so much. We really appreciate uh, your time and information, Kate. And thanks, everybody, for joining us today. And hopefully the rain has stopped and people can go back out if they need to. Yeah, thank you all for attending. I really appreciate it. I hope thank it was you. helpful. Bye. It was. Thank you so much.